Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our stargazing lecture from Caltech Astronomy. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a postdoc in the astronomy department at Caltech, and I will be your MC for this evening's event. Uh, we've got a great lecture. Thank you for joining us on a Thursday. I know these things tend to happen on Friday nights, but uh, due to some weird scheduling stuff, mostly on my end, unfortunately, uh, we, we had to do it on a Thursday. So thank you all for attending. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started. So these, this is uh, one of our stargazing lectures. We ha hold these once a month, again, typically on a Friday. And I don't know the exact date. I think our next one is meant to be March 19th, but it'll be mid to late March is our next one. Um, the schedule for tonight is, I'll finish announcements in about a minute or so, and then we're going to do something new. We're going to have a demonstration of a cool tool, software tool called Space Engine by two of the PhD students in the department, Ryan Rubenzahl and Nikita Kamaraj, who will fly through space and look at different uh, images and 3D renderings of different astronomical objects and talk about the science and what's going on in, in the, 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 the astrophysical phenomena that are present. So that'll last about 10 minutes or so. And then I will introduce our speaker for tonight, Kisha Loy Day, who will talk about looking at stellar births and deaths with, with uh, night vision goggles, which should be super cool. And then that will be about 30 minutes. And then we will have a Q&A panel with, uh, that's featuring both Kisha Loy, myself, and then Eva Scheller and Nicole Wallach, who are two PhD candidates in the... Um, Planetary Sciences Department at Caltech to take questions, field questions from all of you in our audience on a variety of different topics. You're welcome to ask questions related to Keisha Loy's talk um, or on different topics. One of our members of the panel, Eva Scheller, is a member of the Perseverance team, the, the team that, that landed the, the, the rover on Mars last week, which will be super exciting. Um, and Nicole is an expert on exoplanets, so there will be lots of planetary people on board to answer questions, but, uh, but we're, we're comfortable answering lots of questions about astronomy, astrophysics, space science, and, and whatever we can handle. So, um, and that'll take us until nine o'clock. So uh, other things, we also have Astronomy on Tap, which is our sister series of events that typically takes place in a, in a bar or a pub over drinks. Of course, we're not doing it over drinks in person anymore because of the pandemic, but we are doing those live streamed. Our next one of those is probably going to be a week from this coming Monday. No, two weeks from this coming Monday. And it's going to, yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, and those also feature astronomy themed pub trivia, which is super fun. So I will post the information about that event with a poster when we have it. And as a new event that we're going to do, we're at the end of March, we're going to have an astronomy on tap entirely in Mandarin, entirely in Chinese. Uh, we will have it on this YouTube channel, but uh, so, so advertise it to your, your Chinese speaking friends, Mandarin speaking friends, or perhaps you yourself speak Mandarin. I do not, unfortunately, I will not be emceeing. I will be behind the scenes controlling things, but, um, but yeah, that should be super cool. And uh, we're, we're trying to reach out to new audiences. So we're going to have an increased number of, of second language uh, events like, like um, Spanish language events, Chinese events. We're going to try and maybe do a Russian event, but anyway, um, I think those are all my announcements for right now. So uh, can I please get Ryan and Nikita to come on? Great. Thank you, Ryan Rubenzahl, Nikita Kamaraj. So these are two PhD candidates in the astronomy department um, who are going to do a really cool demo using this cool space engine tool. Do you guys want to want to take over? Sounds good. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah. Thanks, so Cameron. We're ready to go. I'll do the share screen. So Space Engine is a realistic virtual universe that you can fly through and explore stars, planets, galaxies, nebulae, black holes, anything you can imagine. Uh, where there is data, mostly from the Hipparchos catalog of stars, as well as known exoplanets and uh, known nebulae. These are all rendered in their correct locations within the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. And where there is not data, it procedurally generates 
planets and all, all varieties of astronomical objects for you to explore. You could easily lose hours <laughs> uh, just searching through the universe. Uh, so Nikita, you wanna take it away? Sure, so uh, we thought that we would probably pick out some key objects that are prominent in the night sky currently and also just interesting objects that um, are fun to kind of look through with this uh, space engine tool. So first up, shall we go to the Orion Nebula, Orion? So Orion, the constellation Orion is very well known. Uh, it's very easily visible even under moderate light pollution you can notice the distinct three stars in the belt of Orion. And just below the belt, even with the naked eye or with the pair of binoculars, you might be able to spot a faint fuzzy cloud. So that's actually the Orion Nebula and we've just zoomed into it now. And Ryan is just showing sort of like a three-dimensional mapping, which uh, this software does uh, based on the two-dimensional images. So Orion, uh, the nebula is what we call an emission nebula. So you can see that there's some uh, coloration and that's essentially um, false color images of like the different kinds of gases within the Orion nebulae. And the way these gases light up is uh, there are stars. Um, if we zoom in a little closer, um, there's this sort of cluster of stars. These are like trapezium stars. Uh, they're very young stars, a couple million years old, and uh, the light that they emit ionizes the surrounding gas. So what this does is essentially produce um, these ions that when uh, be they become excited, they then de-excite and emit radiation. Hence, uh, we have an emission nebulae. So some factual things about the Orion Nebula, it's about 2000 light years away. So we're seeing the light as it looked 2000 years ago. Um, and it is, yeah, it's also a stellar nursery. So because stars are forming in uh, within the nebula, um, it's, it's a region of star formation. So I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add, Ryan. But, um, yeah, do try to, uh, if you have a pair of binoculars, uh, see if you can spot the Orion Nebula. It's also a great target for astrophotography. You don't even need to have a telescope. Um, I've, I've imaged the Orion Nebula with just a, a tripod and a DSLR. So. Okay, so I think we can now move on to another very well-known deep sky object, which is the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, which, as you may guess, uh, can be seen in the constellation of Andromeda. And it's actually one of the very few, uh, probably the only uh, galaxy that can be visible with the naked eye. And you can see it as a very sort of fuzzy, elongated object. And it is our closest major neighbor to the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 2 million light years away. And um, it's, an, it's also a spiral galaxy, as you can see from this image. Um, so if you look you know, through a telescope, you can see very prominent dust lanes in Andromeda. It's another great object for um, deep sky astrophotography. Andromeda is actually on a collision course with the Milky Way and will probably collide with the Milky Way um, in a few uh, billion years time. And when that collision happens, it will form a elliptical galaxy. So Andromeda is um, it's a barred spiral galaxy. And yeah, it, it's it's pretty, you know, even with the naked eye on a on a moderately light polluted uh, City. If you if you have a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to make it out as, as a fuzzy object. Um, and so, one interesting thing about galaxies, which you know I study, um, supermassive black holes. And so, we think that at the center of every galaxy is an 
supermassive black hole. So I think another interesting object to look at would be uh, the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And this is Sagittarius A star. So you can't, because it's a black hole, it's not visible. It's not something you can really see in the night sky, but the Milky Way band is visible um, if you go to a dark site. Uh, and Sagittarius A star, unsurprisingly, is in the constellation Sagittarius. So um, black holes are always cool. I am definitely biased because that's my area of research. Uh, Sagittarius A star is, it has a mass of about a few uh, million solar masses. It's not uh, a very strongly accreting system, so it doesn't have like an accretion disk around it, uh, but it does have periods where um, its activity becomes pretty uh, high and you can observe flaring events. And the star in, in the name Sagittarius A star is kind of denoting that it, it was originally identified as a radio uh, bright source by Carl Jansky. And then more deeper investigation revealed that uh, it had various subcomponents. And so the A star um, technically refers to like an excited state uh, of atoms, but uh, just sort of like one of the subcomponents of the Sagittarius A star system. And we know the properties of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy very well because of the stars that orbit around Sagittarius A star. Um, I don't know, Ryan, if you can, are, are those the orbits of, of the stars? Yep. So um, we've been able to very accurately map out the orbits and trajectories of stars that we see orbiting around this invisible system. And that's how we are able to get good constraints on, on the properties of, of Sag A star, such as its mass and um, uh, diameter and uh, luminosity and so on and so forth. So uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, if you have heard of it, um, has which produced those beautiful images of M87 is also uh, looking at uh, Sagittarius A star and forming images, um, images of it. So keep an eye out for that press release. So with that, uh, Ryan, uh, is there anything else we do? We want to look at any other objects? Does the audience have any preference? Good question. Audience, do you guys, do you guys have any requests on things that, that we could look at with this program? I, I see there are a few questions about Space Engine itself. Uh, is it available for PC? I think Ryan should probably answer this. Yeah, so currently it's only available on PC and not on Mac. That feature has been coming soon for a long time. This program is actually completely created by a single software developer in his, spare, in his own spare time. So pretty incredible that all of this came from just one person coding. That is pretty um, good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, PC, there's a free version, which is what we're demonstrating here. You can download that on the Space Engine website. It's an older version, so it doesn't have sort of like the newer updates, but it is free. So you can test it out and just play around with it. There's a paid version, which has much more features and is constantly updated that's available through Steam. So I see there's one request. Are we able to uh, zoom into the Milky Way from the outside? I guess an external view of the Milky Way. Yeah, so this is the Milky Way here. You can see the two uh, satellite uh, galaxies, the large and small Magellanic clouds. And the cool thing about this is like, as you get closer to the galaxy, it'll start to render all those stars and they'll all start to pop into view. And I've easily lost hours just clicking from star to star. It'll give you a little bit of information about them. Uh, all of these ones with the RS tag on the top are randomly generated. I think that stands for random star. Um, but some of these, if you get lucky, oh, here we go. Uh, might have one with life uh, just randomly generated. 
Um, this one actually appears to be in a triple star system. So that's kind of cool. And if we open up the little family view of it, we can see the different stars in this, um, in this system. We can expand to some of these other stars. And it looks like this planet here is actually, what would the phrase be, circumternary? Uh, is actually orbiting all three of the stars together. And there's a frozen ice world, has all these different facts about it. Just some, some randomly generated planet. You can find some pretty cool systems uh, just by exploring. I didn't mean to click that. Um, how do I make this go away? There we go. I think this journey log has some example ones uh, already saved into it. So, oh no, this is all the things that we've been to. One of these buttons <laughs> has a bunch of uh, interesting objects preloaded into it, like a moon that's kind of like Endor or uh, a planet that's kind of like Tatooine um, or a Earth-like planet that has a ring system around it, which is pretty cool. Or planets inside, planets around stars inside clusters. Uh, and you can also land on them and actually explore their terrain. That's very cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, um, audience members, if you have requests, we're planning to potentially make some short pre-recorded clips and upload them to our YouTube channel of exploring different aspects of, of astronomical targets and objects um, using Space Engine. So if you have targets that you're particularly interested in seeing, uh, feel free to request them in the, in the comments and we'll, we'll take them into account when we're trying to assemble some of these pre-recorded videos that we'll put up at some point in the next few weeks or months. But, um, Thank you, Ryan and Nikita. That was great. That was super awesome. Um, OK. L I'm going to turn things over to our speaker. Kishaloy, do you want to come on? Excellent. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Uh, yeah, so Kishaloy is, um, is finishing his PhD this spring, I believe. That's correct, right, Kishaloy? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, I think I read, you're starting, you're starting a Kavli fellowship at MIT. Is that correct? A Hubble fellowship. Uh, oh, it's a Hubble fellowship. Oh, yeah. look at you. Nice work. So for those of you who don't know, Hubble fellowship is kind of the, the most esteemed, uh, highest profile national fellowship that you can get once you finish your PhD to go to essentially the institution of your choice within the United States. And, um, but you're going to MIT, correct? Yes, yes. Oh, awesome. Well, congratulations, dude. That's Thank great. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm getting distracted. Kishaloy, Kishaloy Day is a finishing PhD student in the astronomy department at Caltech who will soon be taking a Hubble fellowship to MIT. He builds software to handle large data streams from sky surveys to, to study exploding stars in the distant galaxies and in our own Milky Way. So, um, and he's going to talk a bit about that for us tonight. So take it away, Kishaloy. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Cameron, for that introduction. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. I realize the virtual experience is a bit different from the in-person experience, but hopefully you'll get to learn a few cool things tonight about uh, uh, what I do and what uh, infrared astronomers do. So um, a lot of the talk today is going to be about um, looking at the invisible sky and just to you know, clarify, when I say invisible tonight, I don't necessarily mean uh, something's invisible because it's too faint for us to see. Uh, more generic generically, what I mean when I say invisible is that we are trying to look at light that our eyes cannot detect. So we have to resort to other techniques that, you know, that are different from the way uh, our eyes work or in general um, detectors work in the optical bands. And that's going to be about the infrared sky and what the infrared sky tells us about the universe. So I wanted to start with this really remarkable, iconic picture. I think uh, many of you would have probably seen this picture in other contexts. And this is, in fact, in the same Orion constellation that Nikita uh, showed us around a while ago. And what you see here is uh, what is known as the Horsehead Nebula, which is this structure over here. 
And uh, in case you weren't convinced that astronomers are creative people, you know, just to compare, you know, this does look like a horse head. You can see there's an uncanny resemblance between this structure and uh, this cartoon horse head. And what this really is, if you wonder, is, is, is that it's a cloud of gas and dust. And it's this cloud of gas and dust that's essentially blocking off the light from the background that we see over there. So there's a beautiful pink background that's been blocked off by this light. And over this talk, we will learn about why uh, dust or gas tends to uh, absorb all of this light and how uh, new techniques of observation allow us to pierce through these um, regions of the universe. And overall, this region that you see, it's, uh, it's essentially a stellar nursery, uh, very similar to the one that Nikita was showing us earlier, uh, which is forming a lot of young stars, baby stars in this environment. You can see one of those right over here. There's this young baby star that's almost blowing out this bubble around it um, as it forms. And in fact, if you go outside right now, and if you look, uh, if you live at a, you know, a, a, at a relatively dark place, and if you have a pair of binoculars, then you should be able to see this uh, kind of structure up in the Western sky right now in the Orion constellation, pretty close to um, Orion's belt. So uh, I wanted to sort of pick up this, uh, this uh, chain of why this uh, dust cloud appears to appears dark relative to the background. So, uh, and I wanted to draw from a, a relatively common experience, and I hope you know uh, all of you would be able to relate. Which is that if you look at the sun during daytime, although you know, do not look at the sun during daytime. It's it's not it's not it's harmful for your eyes. Just this is a picture taken with a camera, and uh, when you uh, take a picture of of the sun with a camera during daytime, you see that it almost appears white, and that's because the sun is emitting light at a lot of different wavelengths. So all the way going from the blue wavelengths to the red wavelengths. And when you put all of that together, it tends to appear white. But if you look at the same sun during the evening, you see that it tends to develop this reddish hue. And uh, the only difference that really occurs between these two scenarios is the fact that we are looking at a sun through different amounts of the atmosphere. So if you look at the, of the, at the left picture, what you have here is that the rays from the sun are hit right on top of the atmosphere. It only traverses a relatively short distance and it reaches your camera or your eyes and so on. But when you're looking at the evening sun, what you're seeing is that uh, the light has to travel a longer distance. And more importantly, it has to travel a distance which goes through a lot of the dense layers of the atmosphere, things, uh, layers that have dust and molecules and so on. And it's that dust and molecules that tends to absorb light, which produces the reddish color. And uh, to illustrate that, what I wanted to show is this plot, which essentially shows the, on the y-axis is the percentage of absorption or scattering that uh, the light undergoes as a function of wavelength. And as you see, so uh, the, the, the largest wavelengths on this side are red light and the bluest is you know, blue light that we see over here. And what you see is that as you go towards shorter and shorter wavelengths, which is towards bluer light, uh, the amount of scattering increases drastically. So what that means is that when you have light travel through such a thick layer of the atmosphere, all of the blue light just gets absorbed and only it's the red light that passes through, which makes the sun appear red. And it turns it's quite remarkable that pretty much the same effect occurs everywhere in the galaxy, pretty much to, to every star that we see in our own galaxy. So um, to, to, to show that, what I wanted to show is this picture of uh, you know, the state of the art picture of what we think our Milky Way looks like. So this is our galaxy as seen from Earth. It's this band of light in the sky. And this is as has been seen by the Gaia space mission, which is a revolutionary new instrument that's uh, mapping the orbits of every single star in the galaxy. So if you uh, look at the maps created by the Gaia mission, what you will see is that on this sort of background of bright stars, you see this, uh, the, the, the white haze that you see in the background, there are these rich structures, these dark bands and clumps that you see in our galaxy that essentially block out all of the light from the rest of the stars in the galaxy. So in reality, what, what, you, what you're seeing here is that the, there is this continuous smooth distribution of stars in the galaxy, this bright bulge and this disk that you see over here. And in front of that, all of the rich structures that you see, these individual clumps and trails and so on, th these are essentially dust, regions of dust that are blocking out all of the light coming from these stars, making it appear uh, with these interesting patterns. And you know, it, because um, dust tends to absorb light in at blue wavelengths, if you take a picture of any of these individual regions of the galaxy with a, you know, with a high-end camera, what you would see is that all of these stars in these regions appear to appear extremely red. 
And uh, so that does not necessarily mean that these stars are intrinsically red, like stars are emitting red light by themselves. A lot of this redness appears because all of the dust that we see in these regions, these are absorbed, uh, these, these absorb the blue light from these stars and make them appear red. So much so that pretty much all of, most of the stars in our galaxy are hidden to some extent by the dust along our own galaxy. So um, naturally you would expect that because um, uh, a lot of the blue light is, gets completely absorbed by this dust, is there a way that we can use other forms of techniques to, to look at this missing light? Especially because when you, once you notice this trend over here, you see that as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, the, the absorption tends to become lower and lower. So the question is, can we go further and further out, go to even longer wavelengths so that we can beat this absorption completely and look right through the dust. And uh, this is what uh, infrared astronomy is about. This is a really unique part of infrared astronomy where uh, what I'm showing here is uh, light classified as a function of wavelength. So the shortest wavelengths that we study the universe at are gamma rays and the longest wavelengths are radio waves. The visible light surprisingly is a really small part of this spectrum. This tiny, this tiny patch that you see over here, this is pretty much all that our eyes can see, which goes all the way from the, you know, the blue light to the red light that you see in a rainbow. And if you go slightly out from this range, uh, go from wavelengths of about 750 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers, this is what we call as the near infrared uh, wavelengths. And uh, as you would imagine, uh, because we are going further out into this into this curve over here, when you go into the infrared regime, you're completely piercing through all of this obscuring dust that's uh, blocking off all of this light. So um, just to uh, convince you that that is the case, I wanted to show this picture. So this is a picture of our own galaxy. We're looking right into the plane of the galaxy. As you see, there's this beautiful stellar background. And uh, you know, all of a sudden you see that there's almost this void, if you will, of stars in the middle. And that's a bit surprising because you might say, you know, why is there a void of stars in the middle of our galaxy? Uh, but this is, again, this is the optical. And what you see, in, what you're seeing here essentially is a cloud of dust. So if you look at the same cloud of dust in the infrared, what you see is that you're able to pierce right through that cloud. And you see that the infrared light from the stars that are being hidden in the optical light reach, are now reaching us so that we can actually study these stars in a way that's impossible to do at optical wave bands because uh, dust tends to absorb all of this light. So this is a completely new window uh, into understanding how the universe works, especially uh, studying um, uh, regions of the universe that are uh, uh, really difficult to study in the optical wave bands. So um, naturally, you might say that, okay, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the infrared wave bands seem a really attractive place to study stars in our own galaxy, given that there's so much dust. But as it turns out, that um, uh, it's, uh, the, the infrared astronomy has quite a few challenges, and I wanted to sort of uh, talk a bit about those challenges to drive home um, uh, the facts about you know, why infrared astronomy uh, is, is difficult in general and why there's almost a renaissance right now of infrared astronomy. So the uh, now caveat number one is going to be, you know, the bane of uh, infrared astronomers, which is uh, uh, because, which is that we have an at atmosphere above us. So, um, so because all ground-based observations, every ground-based telescope um, occurs from the ground, which has the atmosphere above it, I'm showing here uh, a plot of the transmittance, which is essentially how much, what percentage of light coming from astronomical sources reaches the ground as a function of wavelength. And what you see here is that uh, most of the light that we see in the, in the optical is this very tiny range of wavelengths that you see over here, whereas uh, the entire range of wavelengths is obviously much larger, but, because we are living, living below the atmosphere, you see that there are these molecules in the atmosphere, things like water and carbon dioxide and oxygen. These absorb a lot of the light in the infrared, which means that if I you know, was to you know, have a telescope, say, observing between six and seven microns, I would pretty much see nothing from, the, uh, from any astronomical source because all of that light is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. So it's not useful for me to um, you know, have a telescope over there. And uh, the talk, this talk is going to be about the near infrared regime, which is this part of the spectrum over here between about one and three microns. And because uh, no, our eyes, as well as normal uh, CCD detectors, the ones that we use for optical astronomy, they're not sensitive in this, uh, in the near infrared spectrum, we have to use special and somewhat expensive detectors to study this part 
um, of the spectrum. And if you go further out, you know, say beyond a few microns, the only way to study this uh, this part of the spectrum is with space telescopes, because uh, you know, once you go into space, all of the problems with the atmosphere go away. But obviously, this comes at the cost of you know, having expensive space missions that are able to um, uh, to study these objects. So uh, the next thing that is uh, perhaps not as obvious and not as intuitive is the fact that uh, not only astronomical sources, but it turns out that once you go into the infrared, the earth itself starts emitting light. And uh, just to demonstrate that what I'm showing here is again, a spectrum, which on the y-axis is showing some measure of how bright the sky is as a function of wavelength. So uh, these individual bands that you see over here, these are uh, the so-called uh, classical uh, uh, filters that we use to uh, sort out light into wavelengths. As you see, there are these bands that we call J, H, and K. That, um, the, and these are the individual uh, ranges of wavelength that we study in astronomy because uh, uh, the, the, the portions in the middle, these, these are regions of really low atmospheric transmission so that we don't really see light coming from astronomical sources in this region. And uh, what you see here in, the, in black is that there's in addition to the light that comes from astronomical sources, there are these individual spikes of radiation. And all of this is not coming from anything that has to do you know, with space. This is actually coming from the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason we have this in the Earth's atmosphere is because the Earth's atmosphere has molecules. It has ions. It has ionized molecules everywhere floating around space. And whenever you have something like that, uh, molecules tend to rotate and vibrate. And whenever they do that, they tend to emit light. So when you excite a molecule to rotate and vibrate, it emits light. And it is this light that appears as these extremely bright uh, lines in the in the infrared band. So uh, the the net result of all of this is essentially uh, the the rather concerning fact that the infrared sky is actually not dark at night. So you know when you go out at night and you look up at the sky, you see that the sky is dark compared to the day with our own optical eyes. But if you were to have infrared eyes and you could look at the sky at infrared wavelengths, what you would actually see is that the sky is not dark. It's actually really bright even at night just because there are these all these molecules that are uh, radiating their own light from the atmosphere. And this really makes at the infrared astronomy fundamentally challenging to do from the ground. Um, one thing that is really curious that relates a lot to the night vision goggles uh, uh, that uh, I wanted to highlight in this talk is the fact that if you notice, if you go out to longer and longer wavelengths, you will see that there's this extremely fast rise of radiation that you know, starts beyond say about two and a half microns in wavelength. So uh, what you see over there is another really interesting piece of physics, which is the fact that every object in the universe that has any finite temperature emits its own radiation. And uh, what I mean by that is the fact um, that as many of you would have uh, could have would have probably studied in high school, there is this thing called black body radiation, which essentially um, uh, is, is a kind of radiation that is emitted by every body that has a certain temperature. So here I'm showing again the brightness as a function of wavelength for different types of objects. So the sun, which has a temperature of about 6,000 kelvins, you see that most of its light, it peaks at in the visible band, which is where our eyes see, which is good for us, which means that we can see a beautiful sun during the daytime. But as you go to colder and colder objects, you know, things that say the earth around us, everything around us is, is at a temperature of say about um, 30 degrees Celsius, which is 300 Kelvin. And you see that it also emits light except it's much fainter and it's also shifted towards redder wavelengths. So you go to longer and longer wavelengths. And that goes on continuously to pretty much everything in the universe, so much so that even the, the Earth's atmosphere, the cold sky also emits its own radiation corresponding to its temperature, which is about uh, 80 Kelvin. And what that means is that if you were to look at the sky at infrared wavelengths, far, you know, at, at, at large enough wavelengths, you would actually see the entire sky glow because of this radiation that's coming from the sky. And uh, just to illustrate a really common life example of this. So if I went into my friend's room at night, uh, with you know with no lights on this is what i would see because you know my lights my, my eyes are not sensitive to infrared light they only see optical light which is uh, uh, not there without uh, any external source of light but if i had infrared eyes what i would see is that i would see things in the dark and all of this radiation is coming from this um, hot body which in this case is a cat which is emitting its own radiation so this is exactly how uh, some night vision goggles work in the sense that what night vision goggles do is that even though there is no visible light that is being emitted by objects in the dark around us, what you can do is you can 
catch the infrared light and you know, use detectors to catch the infrared light and then show it to us using uh, these night vision goggles. So, and this is uh, what is known as the field of thermal imaging, which allows us to study um, uh, objects in the dark um, uh, because of the radiation that they emit by themselves. So, um, so with that sort of first half in, in, in trying to introduce the, you know, what infrared astronomy is about, I wanted to really uh, start off with what is the next frontier in infrared astronomy, a field which is uh, very close to my heart, which is, um, uh, so far we've seen that um, the universe appears very different depending on what wavelength you're looking at. But what we also know now and quite well is that, that the infrared, the, the universe actually changes with time as well. So one of the really um, uh, unique pieces of physics that comes up as, as a, um, uh, from being able to study the universe in the infrared is that we can map the changes in the infrared sky as a function of time. And all of this you know, relates back to really unique physics that, uh, is, is, uh, that, is, um, that we can study only in the time domain. One of which is, for example, that stars change in brightness with time. So here I'm showing an animation of a star that, uh, uh, that um, expands in size, uh, and as it expands, the temperature changes, and as the temperature changes, it it, it falls back in and becomes um, uh, hotter. So, uh, so stars change in brightness all the time, and this is is a uh, really uh, um, uh, is a field that's growing a lot these days. It's known as astro seismology that allows us to almost map out the interior structures of stars based on how they're changing with time. And the other thing is that uh, some stars actually change uh, in brightness quite substantially when they um, are either formed or when they die. So here I'm showing an, an animation of uh, a supernova that, uh, that occurs in the near galaxy. So supernovae are uh, uh, mark the deaths of stars. So these are stars that are dying away in these remarkable explosions. This is one that was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, when they explode, they explode in a way that they become so bright that they almost outshine their uh, entire galaxies. And this is something that uh, are unique tracers of where you know, all of the chemicals that we see around us are synthesized in the universe. So, um, so far, you know, we've, we've been able to study these changes quite well with optical time, uh, optical uh, detectors in the sense that uh, the, this is light that our um, uh, eyes can detect. And a lot of the, the progress that has come in our capabilities to study uh, the, time, the time behavior of these objects comes from the fact that we can create bigger and bigger cameras. So the bigger, the bigger camera you have, the larger amount of sky you can take pictures of. And if you go to bigger and bigger cameras, you become more efficient at mapping the entire sky. So I wanted to show examples of some of the uh, really state-of-the-art cameras when it comes to astronomical cameras today. This is one which is called the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is at Palomar Observatory uh, in California. And uh, this is uh, one of the largest cameras today. It's, uh, it has about 700 million pixels in it. Uh, and you know, just to compare that, uh, the, the, the cameras in your cell phones, they typically have maybe about 20 million pixels or 50 million pixels. Uh, th so these are you know, obviously about 10 times bigger, and they are really sensitive to faint light. And the next you know, state of the art that's coming up very soon is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is going to come online in a couple of years. And this is going to be the largest astronomical camera ever created, again, in the optical bands with about 3 billion pixels. So this is really the state of the art when it comes to uh, astronomical cameras in the optical. And it's really this picture that leads me to the next caveat and you know, perhaps a really interesting one when it comes to infrared astronomy, is the fact that infrared detectors are just because of the way they are created, they're about 10 times more expensive per pixel compared to optical cameras. And what that means is that, is that, uh, you know, for, that for a given amount of um, uh, funding that you have to, to, to buy a camera, we can actually not cover as much of the sky because you know, the cameras are, uh, are, are intrinsically smaller because they're so expensive. So uh, one of the things that uh, we've, uh, we've um, done with, uh, in order to tackle this problem, to, um, uh, to actually study the sky at infrared wavelengths as a function of time is to do a trick. And the trick is by asking the question, how can we take bigger pictures of the same piece of sky with the same detector? So um, just to illustrate how this works, so say I had a camera with 1 million pixels and I took an image of a nearby galaxy. So this is an example. So this is an, uh, uh, an image with uh, uh, 1 million pixels. So it's 1,000 pixels on each side. You see there's this beautiful pair of galaxies. You see a lot of interesting structure. You see, or you see the dust lanes in the spiral arms of the galaxies uh, individually over here. But then you, know, you think of it and then you say that uh, I'm, you know, if I really wanted to 
study phenomena that change with time, I'm really interested in looking at things that are really bright. You know, so for example, the supernovae that we look for, they're nearly as bright as the galaxy itself when they explode. And as far as you know, time domain behavior, the, the behavior that the change with time is concerned, I'm not really interested in studying these individual spiral arms or whatever these individual structures in the galaxy. So I can actually get away by getting, taking the, uh, an image of the same galaxy with a much coarser resolution. So this is the picture of the same galaxy, except it's not 1 million pixels uh, across, it's only 10,000 pixels. It's only 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And as you see, it's a, you know, it's a much coarser image. I don't see this, these beautiful arms or structures anymore. But as you will see later on, this is actually enough to find bright sources changing on top of galaxies. And what this allows me to do is that because now I, have a, I, I can capture the same part of sky with a 100 times smaller camera, I can actually use the rest of the camera to cover a much bigger part of the sky. So here I'm showing that if I took that same 1 million pixel camera and said that I'm not really interested in these you know, narrow structures in the galaxy, instead I'll just use this camera to get a coarse image of the galaxy and actually get a much bigger portion of the sky. And this is what allows us to um, get a much bigger portion of the sky with the same detector. And that's what leads me to uh, the specific instrument that I, I've been really closed in, uh, closely involved with during my thesis. So uh, this is Palomar Observatory. In case you haven't uh, uh, had a chance to visit it, I'd, I'd strongly recommend you please pay a visit uh, you know, once the pandemic is over. It's a really remarkable site. It, is, it's, it has a bunch of different telescopes all doing their own special thing. And um, uh, the telescope that I, I work with is this, uh, is inside, it's almost behind these bunch of trees over here. And over there, if you went there, you would see there's this dome which sort of opens up into the sky. Uh, the, and inside this dome lives our telescope. And uh, so this is the telescope that I, I use. This is called uh, Palomar Gettini IR. It's, um, it's the first uh, wide field infrared survey that is able to cover nearly the entire sky uh, because of a very large field of view. We'll come to the field of view in a bit. But just to illustrate, you know, this, this, field, this, this telescope is actually pretty small. It's only a 30 centimeter telescope. So it's, it's a 0.3 meter telescope and it operates only in at a wavelength of 1200 nanometers. So that's well outside the optical band. So this is light that our eyes cannot see at all. And it has only about 4 million pixels. So 4 million pixels is a relatively modest size detector. It's not a big detector compared to the field of view that we can achieve. And we commissioned this telescope back about uh, you know, two and a half years ago, back in September, 2018. And this is an image of the same uh, Andromeda galaxy that we were seeing earlier from Nikita. Uh, 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 which, this is again in infrared light, as you see, you also see the, the structures in the galaxy over here. And uh, actually, before I move on, I wanted to, a lot of people ask me, wh why is this telescope called Gatini? So uh, I guess you know, some people may have realized, but Gatini is actually um, kittens in Italian. Uh, don't ask me where that name came from. It came from a time that was before me, but the camera is called Gatini because uh, that has some relation to kittens in uh, Italian. And in, in order to honor the kitten, I made this logo for the survey. And uh, as you see, it's, uh, it's meant to highlight this kitten over here. Uh, and I was pretty happy with this logo when I made it, except uh, uh, I think a month or two after I made this logo, one of my colleagues at Caltech came up to me and told me that, uh, you know, given that I know nothing about cats, which is that uh, apparently this is the posture that a cat takes when it's about to poop. So, you know, in hindsight, this may not have been the best logo, but, uh, you know, uh, it is still, you know, it's, so which is why I've ne never really shown this logo in a professional talk, but, you know, it's, it's an interesting logo to honor the cat's name. All right. So, Moving on, um, uh, so I, I wanted to you know, highlight how big this camera is and how, how much of the sky we can cover given, this, uh, given the technique that we use to really make coarse images of the sky. So here I'm showing a plot of uh, the field of view as in how much of the sky um, each of these uh, surveys can take. So all of these are optical surveys. These surveys detect light that are uh, also visible to our own eyes. So this is the one of the state of the art, which is the Zwicky Transient Facility. It has a, a 50 square degree field of view. That's about, you know, it's, uh, you, you can compare it to the moon over here. So it's about a hundred times larger than, um, than uh, the full moon and definitely uh, many, many times larger than our nearby Andromeda galaxy. And uh, uh, what this infrared camera allows us to do is that because we have the way we've designed the camera to take really coarse images, this is nearly half the field of view of uh, ZTF itself, which is uh, the optical system. And it's by far the largest infrared camera that's ever been created in terms of field of view. The next biggest camera is this guy over here, which is, uh, so this is the Vista telescope, which is um, a, a four meter telescope that has about a half square degree field of view. 
And because this is extremely large field of view, we can actually take pictures of nearly half the visible sky every single night. So that really gives you a sense of how much we've come from you know, getting these really small, uh, using these really small detectors to cover really large portions of the sky. So um, at this point, you might ask, OK, uh, I have a really coarse image of a galaxy uh, that I took. Does this actually allow me to find transients, find, find things that change on top of this galaxy? So uh, that's what I wanted to um, you know, uh, discuss a bit over here. So here is an image of the same galaxy that uh, you know, I probably took last night. And uh, here is an image of the same galaxy that I took two years ago. Now, um, at, you know, at, at first sight, you might say that there's nothing really that's changed. You know, these two galaxies pretty much look the same. So maybe we haven't discovered anything. But as it turns out, because we today have techniques to um, properly subtract images, so essentially what you do is you take this new image and you do a subtraction. So you subtract this image from this image and you try to find something. So in this case, what you see is that even though you don't see anything obvious with your eyes, when you subtract the two images, you see that there's this new star that pops up on top of the galaxy that actually wasn't there before. And this is actually a supernova, um, um, a massive star that has died in that galaxy and produced this remarkably bright explosion. And even though we have, you know, really coarse pixels that are not really meant to study galaxies, these are actually pretty well suited to find things like this by subtracting them. Now, uh, I would be lying if I told you that this is the end of the story. You know, it's not really an, as simple a subtraction as it looks like. In reality, it's, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of interesting mathematics that goes behind it. And uh, I know th this is a you know, discussion for a different day and a different talk. But yes, uh, astronomers do also spend a lot of time trying to develop the mathematics to do this correctly. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting um, uh, stuff going on here as well. Okay. So, uh, so in the last part of the talk, in the last few minutes, I wanted to um, highlight what we, what have we learned from being able to study the infrared sky as a function of time uh, or with with a large camera like this. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that a lot of stars in our galaxy and, and everywhere else, the stars are formed inside these dense gas clouds. So here I'm showing a, 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 a nebula. This is a star forming region. As you see, there's a lot of beautiful gas and stars around. And each of these individual pellets that you see over here, these are individual stars forming uh, inside their own gaseous nebula. So uh, if you zoom into any of these individual stars, uh, what you would see is this uh, this torus, this 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 disk of gas that surrounds the new baby star that's being formed over here, and this baby star is sort of pulling on this gas, and you know, and uh, uh, because of its gravity, it tends to pull off all of the gas towards it, and as as it does that, it tends to brighten up significantly. And during this process, it's just pulling gas, pulling gas, and at, at some point, the the gravity of the star becomes strong enough that, and the star becomes hot enough that it starts fusing hydrogen into helium and uh, produce, and that leaves behind this uh, sort of this uh, young star that's, uh, that's just been born. And this is a star that will you know, go on to live for a few billion years. But uh, what is perhaps even more important in terms of understanding the star formation process is the fact that some of these stars, when you have these extremely dusty clouds around them, some of this dust tends to accumulate. And as, this, as the dust accumulates around these stars, they tend to form planets, you know, planets like our own Earth. And you know, understanding the star formation process is, very, is, is an integral part of understanding where our, the planets that we see around us come from and how, how these are formed from um, these uh, intense star forming regions. So as I was saying, um, uh, a lot of these uh, stars are, are formed inside these extremely dusty clouds, which means that if you look for these, um, uh, these, um, uh, these stars forming in the infrared, we should be able to find many, many more of these, these star forming events, these uh, eruptions that occur from these uh, young stars. So here is a really interesting example that we found very recently, which is, you see there's this new source that appeared in one of the images that we took one night. And if you subtract the same, you see that, uh, subtract an image from a few months ago, you see that there's this star that pops out. And uh, we were clearly excited about what this was. And we took an image from, uh, uh, from a bigger telescope with a higher resolution. We saw that there was this nebula that had lit up around uh, 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 at, at this position. So it's not really a star, it's more of a 
uh, nebula that has lit up. And this is actually quite similar to what we've seen in other uh, uh, star forming regions. So what you're seeing here, essentially this young star that, so, uh, that has almost carved out this nebula around it because of jets. And this is a similar nebula that has been imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope where you can get extremely good resolution and understand the star formation process. And I know most importantly, I think for this particular case, uh, because this star was being born inside such a dense dark nebula, uh, this this thing is actually a nearly a million times fainter in the optical compared to the infrared. Just you know, uh, sort of emphasizing why um, understanding um, the star formation in extremely dusty environments is uniquely pr uh, um, possible with infrared surveys. So the last thing that I'll highlight is uh, you know it's not only that. Uh, we can study um, really young stars being born, but we can also study stars dying with these infrared surveys. So here is an example of what is known as a nova explosion. So uh, for those of you who might be uh, who might have heard of uh, about Type One A supernovae, so uh, so this is a nova explosion occurs when a white dwarf is. Uh, um, pulling in matter from its companion. And at some point, it, the matter becomes hot enough, dense enough that it explodes. But unlike a supernova, a nova actually leaves behind uh, the white dwarf and it just ejects this material um, uh, uh, as a part of the nova explosion. And just understanding this, this nova explosions uh, has been a, a topic of active research for you know, several decades because these are natural pathways to producing um, the, uh, how to, to getting to type 1a supernovae and also producing a bunch of different elements like lithium and sodium. And you know, like I was mentioning, because so many of the stars in our own galaxy are obscured by dust, what we've done is that by looking at in our own galaxy in the infrared, we are able to find a lot of these explosions that are almost invisible in the optical bands. So here I'm showing examples of two uh, of these NOVA explosions that appeared in our data. So again, you see there's this new star that has appeared in our data that wasn't there a few months ago. And when you subtract it out, you see that uh, there's this new star that pops out. And what we were able to show is that with these infrared surveys, we can actually find very large populations of these extremely dust obscured novae in our own galaxy that are almost invisible in the optical and allow us to really place the strongest constraints on how many of these novae occur in the galaxy every year. So with that, I just leave you with a thought of you know, what you know, uh, the infrared um, astronomy is where infrared astronomy is heading. So I think you know, for me, I think infrared time domain astronomy is really a nascent field and it's, you know, it's going to be uh, quite a powerful um, uh, way to study the universe in the in the upcoming uh, decade or so with these big optical surveys coming online, and you know together you know with these innovative telescope designs that allow us to study big uh, uh, big portions of the sky and combined with uh, cheaper detectors. So there are uh, a lot of ideas on how you could create cheaper detectors for the infrared that allow us to create big cameras and study the infrared universe um, with time. So with that, I will leave you with this. Uh, oops, sorry with this animation. Thank you. Excellent talk, Kishaloy. That was super good. And uh, this is an interesting video. So this is a time lapse of the telescope that yeah. over the course of the night, just like finding the targets and observing them and then yeah, so it's a so it's a completely robotic telescope, which makes our life a lot easier because I can go to sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, which means so there's a there's a computer in the dome that decides which part of the sky to observe, and which mean, and, and all all of these decisions are completely autonomous. Like as we speak right now, the telescope is doing this right now because you know it's nighttime here in California. So, uh, so the telescope makes the decisions, observes features of the sky, takes images, and all of the data gets processed by a computer. And I only have to wake up in the morning and look at the data, which makes my. But life how better. are the decisions made on which targets to target? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So what we typically want to observe is is things that are not too close to the horizon because you sort of don't get good quality data over there. So it's sort of a trade-off between trying to observe things that are close to the zenith, which is right above us, and uh, uh, and also trying to uh, uh, to minimize the amount of time between the same pieces of sky. So we want to observe different pieces of the sky as often as we can, uh, provided that we can actu actually still look at that part of the sky, you know, as long as, as it gets high enough in the sky. I see. Well, excellent talk. There were, there were lots of good questions. Um, so, okay, audience members, please write your questions for, for Kishaloy that we will address in the Q&A over the next hour. Um, and, and I would invite our two other Q&A panelists to join us. Um, 
All right, so our, our two other Q&A panelists are Nicole Wallach and Eva Scheller, who uh, work on totally different research. So hopefully um, we, can, we can address questions from the audience, not just on questions related to the content that Kishiloy was presenting, but things related to any questions you might have on astronomy or planetary science or astrophysics. And I will ask, um, Nicole, would you like to give a, a, a short introduction of who you are and what sort of science you work on? So I'm Nicole Wallach. I'm a PhD candidate in planetary science at Caltech, and I study atmospheres. So mostly exoplanet atmospheres, but also a class of failed stars called brown dwarfs. And that's actually in the background, my Zoom background. Uh, feel free to ask me about those objects. So I basically use ground and space-based telescopes to study these atmospheres, to try to understand how these objects form and evolve and accrete their, their atmospheres. I also do some work on direct imaging. So taking direct images, these wonderful pictures directly of protoplanetary disks. So those so stars are born, you have this disk around it that was alluded to in the, the talk before, but we can actually start to understand what's going on with planets forming in those disks by taking direct images of them. So yeah, anything about exoplanets is totally fair game for me. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. Um, Eva, would you like to, to introduce yourself as well? Sure, yeah, hi, my name is uh, Eva Scheller. I am also a PhD candidate uh, in the geological and planetary sciences at Caltech. And uh, so my PhD research is primarily on Mars and other terrestrial planets. I do a combination of modeling, laboratory experiments, working with satellites and working with rovers. And I'm a scientist on the uh, Perseverance Rover Science Team, where in particular I work on sort of planning the day-to-day -day drive and what kinds of experiments we're going to do. And I work on the instruments called MassCAMC and Sherlock. And so if you have any questions about the recent landing, then I'm very happy to answer them. Excellent. Well, congratulations to the science team from last for last week's incredible uh, perseverance landing. Uh, it seems like everything, as far as I can tell, was a big success. Is that is that nominally correct? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, everything basically went as as it was supposed to. Yeah, it was very anomaly free, which is always a great thing. Yeah, well, that's great. That's great. Um, cool. So yeah. Uh, oh, and I guess I'm me. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a, I do computational astrophysics. I study how galaxies form and evolve primarily uh, using computer simulations on big supercomputers. So we run big computers. Uh, we, we don't run big computers. We, we, we send our programs to big computers and run a simulation of a virtual region of space or, or more usually it's like a representative chunk of what should exist in space based on cosmological parameters and form galaxies within that virtual volume of space and see if the galaxies that we form are representative of the kind of galaxies that we see when we look up with telescopes and learn something from that. You know, if we're wrong, why are we wrong? What are we doing wrong in our simulations? If we're right, why are we right? What are we doing right in our simulations? And use that to inform us of what's going on in reality because you know, astronomy is different than other physical sciences, other physical sciences, you conduct an experiment, you know, you come up with a hypothesis and you, uh, let's say you're a chemist, you mix a bunch of chemicals together and then you get an outcome. But with astronomy, I can't say, well, my hypothesis is if, the, if that galaxy is over there and that galaxy is over there and they collide, well, I don't have godlike powers to allow that to occur. But in a computer simulation, I do. So I can move things around and, and conduct virtual experiments. Um, so that's that's what I do. Anyway, so uh, we encourage we have, we already have a bunch of questions, but I encourage questions uh, from the audience in the in the in the YouTube chat for all of the members of our panel, um, specific to their areas of research, whether it's Mars or exoplanets or the super cool infrared work that Kishaloy discussed the last half hour, or even you could ask a, a dumb old computer simulation question of me. Uh, but but ask questions or ask something that may be totally unrelated and we'll see if we can address them. Um, first, I'm gonna ask a couple questions of the panel that were specific to, that were asked during Keisha Loy's presentation. Um, and I think address some of the questions or uh, are, are specific to questions that, um, 
that were that were brought up by the content of Keisha Loy's talk. So, um, well, here's here's a, a, a pretty straightforward question, I think. What makes a nebula dark or bright? Because we see, you know, like the Horsehead Nebula was was dark, but then we see other nebulas that are glowing. So, Keisha Loy, would you like to handle that one? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think um, right. So. Um, so what a nebula is in, you know, in, in, in terms of its constituents, it's just gas and dust. And pretty much most of the light that we see from the nebula is being generated from stars that are being formed inside that nebula. So when you have a young star, a baby star that's born inside that nebula, it tends to uh, radiate all of its surrounding gas and that gas glows. And one of the really interesting things is that if you recall the picture of the Horsehead Nebula, uh, you you would you may have noticed that the light was red, and that's somewhat surprised. Why is it red? And it it turns out that <clears throat> the light is red is because there are these nearby stars that are uh, that are blasting this gas with a lot of radiation, and the most common element in these nebulae in terms of its constituents is hydrogen. So when you have radiation that shines uh, this this ball of hydrogen. In, in, in this nebula, hydrogen tends to radiate at very specific frequencies that corresponds to the energy levels in the atom. So it goes back to the quantum physics that we know about um, with the, the, the radiation, the, the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And it turns out that the strongest transition of the hydrogen atom is at a wavelength that corresponds to about 656 nanometers, and that appears red. So when if you had 656, a nanometer radiation to the human eye that appears red, which is why a lot of the Horsehead Nebula, the background was in pink, well, pink red, and that's because um, that's hydrogen that's glowing from all of the uh, the bright light that's being that's shining on it from these young stars that are being born. And in terms of dark, so the dark is again the dark comes from the fact that. Uh, usually comes from the fact that, that, that there is something that's blocking the light from reaching us. So in this particular case, if you look at the uh, the Horsehead Nebula, what you're seeing there is that there is this cloud of gas and dust that's blocking the light from you know from the background, which is you know bright red in color that's preventing this light from reaching us, and that makes it appear dark. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Trying to be respectful by muting me while other people are talking. Uh, excellent, excellent response, Kishaloy. Thank you for covering that one. Um, a couple of other questions related to uh, the topic that you discuss. What's the range of grain sizes of the dust clouds in these interstellar clouds? And, and where, where do the dust clouds come from? What's their origin? Oh, you've hit like you know really the <laughs> in those active research questions today. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, in terms of um, uh, okay, let's start with that. So I think in terms of grain sizes, what we know today is that the grain sizes of dust can go from about um, uh, one hundredth of a micron to about a micron in size. So these are really tiny dust particles. So so. Um, uh, so yeah, so that that would be the approx approximate range, and it turns out that it's you know mapping out this complete diversity of what the grain sizes are and what are, you know, what kind of dust it is. And in addition to that, what is the composition of the dust? Is it a carbon dust? Is it a silicon dust? Is it an oxygen? No, there are lots of different com compounds that can create dust. And you know, getting understanding the compositions and the grain sizes of dust is a very active field of research today. And it turns out that depending on what kind of region you're looking at, uh, you can get different types of dust uh, in terms of composition as well as size. Um, and I know that relates back to the, the, the other question that Cameron, Cameron asked, which is uh, um, uh, about how these dusts, uh, how dust particles are produced. And that's again, a, a really interesting question in terms of astronomy. So you see all the astronomers are smiling right now <laughs> because it's a, such an interesting question. And uh, one of, so I can you know, uh, tell you a bit about you know, some of the, uh, regions where dust can be produced. So um, the general consensus in astronomy is that is that if you have carbon and you know things like carbon and silicon anywhere in a cold form, it's going to form dust. You know, that's just, just because you know when you form dust, you release energy. That's an exothermic process, and you know things tend to try to you know condense into a form that has a lower energy in itself. So you know whenever you have a sort of 
materials at low temperatures, they tend to form dust. And in terms of the environments that we think they form in, uh, there are things like extremely old stars. So you know, uh, if you ha have a star like the sun, when it eventually grows really old, it's going to expand into this giant. And in the atmospheres of giants like that, we uh, do see evidence of formation of a lot of dust. And, uh, uh, and let's see. Yeah, th there are a, a few different environments. So apart from dying stars, there would be yeah, um, let me think. Cameron, do you know of any other things that you'd like to point out? In terms About of the origin of the dust grains? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so AGB stars, so, yes, so yes. old stars. Um, I guess you could just get spontaneous growth from a, an enriched uh, interstellar medium. The gas that's in between galaxies, that's what, you know, much of what um, Kishaloy has been discussing. You could just over over time have have the, the dust grains start to form out of out of a, a heavily enriched gas. But yeah, I mean, as Kishaloy points out, like, we don't know, we don't have a very, this is an active field of research that people are are, are, are still trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And and the bigger problem, aside from the formation of this, is how you keep this stuff from getting destroyed by energetic light rays and photons that are coming through. Because with, if you have a high enough energy photon coming from a star or more likely coming from, uh, from a accretion disk onto a black hole or something like that, it's going to hit that dust grain and photo dissociate it and blow it up. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging field and we don't have all the answers yet. It's actually but, quite because we usually start from the planetary science side just saying, all right, there's gas and dust around a star. How do we build up planets? So we're like, all right, there's tiny dust grains. How do we get to larger dust grains? And we just take it for granted. It's like, oh yeah, there's dust and there's gas and it's totally fine. And it's really funny to hear the sort of astronomy perspective on that. That's, wait, where did the little dust come from? It's like such an obvious question, but we have so many other questions that are like, how do we get to planets? How do we get from, you know, these micron sized dust grains that we sort of start with and, you know, submicron? So it's actually just kind of funny to hear the other side of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, we lost Eva. Oh no, she's gone. Well, hopefully, hopefully she'll 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 join us again. Um, definitely want to have some Mars questions for her with all the the hubbub and the excitement surrounding perseverance in the last week, and and what it can what it's gonna what it's going to enable us to to study about Mars in the coming years. Um, well, since we're talking with you, Nicole, there was a question that might be appropriate for you called that that's, uh, states, do exoplanet atmospheres come from bombardment or from outgassing from the interior? That's a great question. And the answer is kind of that there's two different classes of exoplanet atmospheres. So we have what are called primary and sort of secondary atmospheres. So those secondary atmosphere is what we consider sort of outgassing things that aren't what are called primordial. So with that gas and dust that you have around that star, that's what's going to be accreted in those primary atmospheres. We expect the atmospheres for those planets to be rather similar to the atmosphere, basically gas that's in the disk. So that amount of what's called metals. So I'm actually kind of glad Eva left for the moment because I was about to say something that's a little bit sort of uh, gets the geologists a little angry. Astronomical metals are very different than geological metals. So when I say metals, I just mean anything that's not hydrogen and helium. Eva would take great issue with that um, because obviously why would you consider stuff like carbon and oxygen metals? But they are to us and that just has to do with abundance. There aren't a lot of those floating around. So we consider those metals. It's sort of everything else that isn't hydrogen and helium. So we expect the atmospheres of the planets to have rather similar in terms of the metallicity, in terms of just the atmospheric composition, to be rather similar to that gas that's around the, uh, the star when it's born and formed. So that's what those primary atmospheres are. And you know, you'll have some accretion of solids that go on as the planet's forming. So when those solids, more, more dust, uh, when you have these dust particles or you know, large grain dust, um, basically going into the atmosphere, they ablate, they get really hot and basically burn up in the atmosphere. And you know, stuff like solids that are carbon and oxygen rich, basically add to the atmosphere that you're looking at. So you have this metal, it's called metal enrichment. All this to say, those are primary atmospheres. That's what I actually study. Uh, I'm not too concerned about rocky planets, uh, personally. Um, as you can tell by my Zoom background, I kind of skew toward the, the gas giants and the, uh, here, um, what are failed stars, so brown dwarfs. 
So I definitely care more about those atmospheres because I think it tells you a lot about the primary formation mechanisms for these planets and the early sort of formation of these. But the answer, long-winded, is both of those are formation and evolution mechanisms for planets, just different classes of planets. Excellent. Um, let's see, another question that I think is, is more, well, it's probably geared for, for a few of us. Um, how does the formation of high mass stars differ from normal stars, especially when viewed from the infrared? So I guess this ties into, you know, the infrared stuff that Kishaloy is doing, as well as like star formation or failed star formation uh, that Nicole is touching on. Oh, and it looks like we got Eva back. Oh, good. Kishaloy or Nicole, you guys want to handle that question? Or I can talk about it too. Welcome back, Eva. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, my computer decided to just reboot for some reason. <laughs> these, these things happen. These things happen. No worries. Um, I was just asking a question of Kishaloy and Nicole, and I guess myself, about that was asked from the audience about... Uh, how does the formation of high mass stars differ from normal stars, especially when viewed from the infrared? So uh, I guess I can speak a little bit about that. So star formation, as, as we've kind of alluded to, tends to occur in, in big groups. So you have a big cloud of gas that will eventually form not just a single star, but form a bunch of stars kind of as a, a brood, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of puppies being laid uh, being like uh, born together, uh, uh, stars get born together as well. And the way in which that gas, gas cloud starts to fragment into different subdivisions, some of them are larger and some of them are smaller. And it turns out there's a lot more small ones than there are large ones. And so what happens is over a, a short period of time, astronomically speaking, which of course is very long compared to uh, human time scales, but over the course of a few or tens of millions of years, you'll get a bunch of stars that are all formed and some of them will be very massive and some of them will, more of them will be very low mass. And just for comparison's sake, the sun is somewhere in the, in the middle range of those uh, scales. And um, the more massive clouds that form the most massive stars, because they, they have more mass, there's more gravitational force that's that's co contracting them and pulling them together. So their cores can get denser and hotter as a result of that. And so they tend to um, they tend to have more radiation because they're burning hotter. But more of that radiation, more of that light is coming forth in the in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and the optical part of the spectrum as opposed to the in the in the infrared. Whereas the lower mass, the smaller stars. Um, because they have less stuff, there's less gravitational pull holding them together, and they, they get lower temperatures in their core, and so they aren't able to ignite as much of a nuclear reaction, or perhaps not at all, which is like what Nicole's talking about in terms of these brown dwarfs. They, they don't have enough mass to, to force together their cores um, to, to have a really good nuclear reaction, and so they would be, but interestingly enough, they're, uh, the light from those, because they're cooler, they, much like what Kishaloy was talking about, the light peaks in the infrared part of the spectrum. Although in comparison to the really bright stuff, even though the, the light peaks in the ultraviolet, they have an enormous profile that extends all the way into the infrared as well. So, so you can definitely learn different things about these stars by looking at them in the infrared, but, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just trying to give some explanation of what the heck's going on. And when we say cold stars, we actually do mean that. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but for example, the objects that I study are 500 Kelvin, and there are some that are a few hundred Kelvin. There are so many planets that we have detected that are much hotter than that. So we really mean cold stars, and they're really actually interesting objects because they're massive. You know, they're much more massive than Jupiter is, you know, 30 Jupiter masses, something like that in that range, but they're actually the radius of Jupiter. So they're very odd objects um, and they are pretty cold. So that's why we expect them to have rather similar, which is why I didn't jump at the chance to start talking about stars. They have similar atmospheres to our planets. So 
So in terms of chemistry, what governs this chemistry that we expect is composition. So Eva, you missed me uh, calling out metals. You dropped off at the perfect time. I was defining astronomical metals and uh, you dropped off, which was perfect timing. So I didn't have to upset you with calling carbon a metal. Um, regardless, so the atmospheres of these ultra cool brown dwarfs are going to be governed based off of their composition, their metallicity, and their temperature. So we expect these sorts of objects to have rather similar atmospheric compositions and sort of properties to exoplanets as opposed to, to stars, which is, I guess, why I study both of those. But just to make a point about, yes, cold stars definitely are cold. Yeah, Great. maybe I can add uh, one uh, in a couple of quick things. So in terms of what we can see in the infrared, it turns out that uh, another thing that's quite ubiquitous when you look at these uh, star forming regions is that even after stars are formed, some tend to leave behind these circumstellar disks around them. So you can have, a, we see a lot of stars where, you know, which are young stars of you know, variety of masses that will have these rings of dust around them that are, you know, are sufficiently far away that they're not blasted by the radiation of the star and they still exist. And those things are actually, they turn up as these infrared emitting objects because as we were discussing, the colder an object is, the more it tends to emit in the infrared. So the pretty much the best way to study these possible far-lying disks from stars is by looking in the infrared, where you essentially, a lot of the times you end up seeing these excess infrared emission that more than what we expect to see from a star of that temperature. And this is what, and you know, and a lot of the times you can actually go back and take very high resolution images and we see evidence of that disk that is sort of, sort of remains around that star, uh, that you know, almost a relic that's left behind from the star formation. That's and, exactly, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, exactly what I work on with my direct imaging stuff is that the extended disks. Um, so it's usually scattered light, which is interesting about the small grain dust that I study actually also in infrared. Um, so the star will basically emit light and that light scatters off of the small grain dust. And that's about micron, like we talked about before. Uh, what I mean by dust is this micron sized dust for what I study. But yeah, exactly. We look for stars that have infrared excesses and then we take images of them and with you know a big camera or Keck basically this 10 meter telescope in the infrared and we see oh what we saw as infrared excesses are these tiny grain dust awesome sorry didn't mean to interrupt but <laughs> I get excited about that <laughs> great job guys um, okay so switching it up a little there's a good question about Mars here uh, the question is, I heard Mars lost most of its atmosphere. Apparently, this was the result of it losing its magnetic field. How does that work? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually a major question in Martian research that we don't necessarily fully know the answer to yet. And there's actually, it's a very hot topic right now. Um, the idea of the you know, uh, losing the atmosphere because it lost its magnetic field um, is a relatively simple idea in which once you sort of have shut off the magnetic dynamo in some way, then you're, um, you're exposing the uppermost part of the atmosphere to the bombardment of all of these different um, um, irons that are coming from, uh, from space and particularly what we call solar wind. And so what will happen is that uh, a phenomenon that's called solar wind stripping in which uh, this bombardment sort of strips the atmosphere. Um, there are a lot of different hypotheses though for how Mars could have uh, lost its atmosphere. So I'll name two other ones that are sort of the primary ones that people research, including me. Um, the first one of course is because I'm a geologist uh, one, one big hypothesis is that it's actually the interaction between rocks and atmosphere that makes the atmosphere lose parts of its, uh, specifically its volatiles. So volatiles are like hydrogen, oxygen, stuff like that. Um, water, you know, that's a big one. Um, and, you know, we form all kinds of mineral structures that actually incorporate a lot, a lot of uh, these um, elements that are in the atmosphere. So that's another way that Mars could have lost part of its atmosphere. Another thing is that we think that Mars had a lot more water in the past. And so if you have a lot of water in, a, in the atmosphere, you actually have a very high hydrogen escape flux. So hydrogen escape um, happens because hydrogen is very light. It can achieve a high velocity that makes it say, you know, just go out of the atmosphere and uh, fly into space. And if you have a really high flux of that, that actually drags along with it 
other um, elements in the atmosphere. And that's what's called hydrodynamic escape. So um, yeah, hot topic right now. <laughs> Great. Um, there have been a couple, uh, a couple of questions about Tabby's star uh, from the audience. I, I know that's a, an interesting topic for a lot of people. In fact, I think these questions, we've had these questions in the past and we weren't able to address them. I don't personally know a lot about Tabby Star. For reference, Tabby Star is a star that we see in the sky that has irregular dimming and brightening. And so people are trying to understand what the heck is going on, like why most stars that we see in the sky are either pretty consistent in their brightness or sometimes they have regular intervals of getting brighter. Like Kishaloi was pointing out in his talk, regular intervals of getting brighter and then fainter and then brighter. But there are some systems that, that produce this kind of irregular chaotic behavior um, and trying to understand what the heck is going on there is obviously a lot more challenging because we can't you know, zoom in and see what's going on around that particular system. Um, do you guys, do you guys, want to comment at all on Tabby Star? All I know is basically what I've read, read from like the Wikipedia article, which isn't perhaps that helpful for our audience members because they too can read the Wikipedia article. So um, do you guys know anything more than, I mean, I can comment on what's there, but. No, okay. Well then I'll just comment on what's there. Uh, Cause I, I mean, I followed the news a bit with it. So it's, um. It's had a substantial dimming, like dimming by, you know, uh, 15, 25% of its brightness, which is pretty, pretty, pretty big. And, and there are different hypotheses for why it's getting fainter. One is just that there's some intrinsic uh, cloud of material, like a ring of material, perhaps in the same way that our solar system, you know, we have planets in a ring in a plane that are orbiting around the sun. And one of the ways that we detect exoplanets is by looking for drops in the light, uh, the brightness of stars when a planet passes in between the observer, us, and the, the, the star system. So it may be that there's a cloud of material that is on a slightly irregular orbit that tends to pass part of it in front of the, the, uh, in, the in the field of view and blocks the light from the, the star on irregular intervals. Um, people have propo proposed that it's a, a swarm of comets because comets tend to be on really uh, elongated orbits as opposed to a nice kind of um, circular or semicircular, uh, or well, not semicircular, but like close to circular orbit. And so maybe if you have a swarm of them, you could block enough of the light to do this, or it could be intrinsic to sunspots on the surface of the star itself that, much like we have sunspots on our sun, and when you have enough sunspots uh, on the surface at, at a at a given time, you can you can cause a decrement in the overall brightness. Although for our sun, that's not that substantial, but I guess you could imagine a certain type of star where that that might be. Um, but it's it's not clear. But I wanted to address it because uh, this user this audience member keeps asking this question and. Um, we're not trying to ignore. It's just we don't we don't have any more insight really uh, as to what's going on than than you may. So, um, you guys have anything else to add on that topic? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's another good question here? Um, how about? What techniques do we use to isolate exoplanets from the glare of their stars while directly imaging them? I guess I'll take this one. Um, so, uh, so with direct imaging, you're totally right. Um, who asked that question? That you have this sun, right, or a star uh, around, you know, in a place that's not the solar system that's super bright, and you're trying to look for something that's really dim. Uh, Kishalai talked about how we have, you know, the black body emission of a planet. And if we have a planet that's, you know, even a thousand Kelvin, much hotter than the Earth, its black body peak still won't make it very bright at where we're looking usually. And even more so, when you look at the star's light, it's just going to completely dominate. But we can take advantage of the fact that the star and the planet are not exactly overlapping. They are separated. You know, if you're looking at it sort of what's called face on, so star here, orbit of the planet this way, you'll see that it's separated here. And if the system is close enough to us, we can resolve that difference. If it's too far away, we can't see that difference. But assuming that the system is close enough to us, we can resolve that. And we use what's called coronography. 
So basically, it's kind of like when you put your thumb up to the sun and you're blocking out the sunlight and you kind of see the ring around the sun when you do that. Sort of akin to that. It's a little bit more fancy. There's a lot more sort of optics involved. But basically, you're just blocking out the sun's light so you can see the planet around it. So there's a couple of really big caveats to that, mostly like I alluded to before, the system has to be close to us. And you know we don't have a lot of directly imaged planets because it's very, very hard. Uh, is also kind of, I think, the, the crux of the matter with this, but basically a chronograph. Good, good response. Uh, let's see. How about this? This is a question, I guess, for all four of us. How would you recommend a high schooler to get involved in astronomical research? What do you guys think? Any tips? At the risk of talking again, I'm sorry. Oh, um, please, by all means. I actually did get involved in astronomical research when I was in high school. Um, so basically you can literally just cold email people. I know it seems absolutely terrifying, but please just do it. Just email a professor, email a grad student, just email somebody. Um, I know most of my labs take high school students all the time to do direct research and we'll find a project for you. But if that's not something you wanna do or something that you have you know, the ability to take you know, an entire summer or something like that to do, uh, there are plenty of you know, local astronomical clubs you can do um, you can come to our events when they come back to being in person. Uh, it really depends on the capacity you want to, but if you want to do direct research, totally cold email people. If you email enough people, people will respond. I, well, believe me, they will. Yeah, one thing I, I might add to that is that even though it appears that a lot of the physics that we do is really complicated, in reality, it's still, you know, it's actually high school physics, a lot of it, you know, uh, in the sense that, you know, Astronomical systems are really big, which actually makes them really simple to deal with. Because you know, a lot of the, I would say, in terms of the theoretical physics aspect right now, is focused on really small things. You know, things like quantum mechanics and string theory or whatever. Whereas in terms of the systems that we deal with in astronomy, a lot of that can actually be explained by high school or undergrad level physics. So if you were really interested to even sort of get involved in the theory level project then I think even that only requires a relatively basic understanding of physics. You don't have to, you know, know how to solve Schrodinger's equations to get to, you know, some astronomical research. It's actually, you can start with Newton's law for gravity and solve pretty much the entire universe as, as it is. So I think that's really a remarkable aspect of astronomy, which is that I think uh, uh, because these systems are really big, they're, they, you can, we can deal with them with relatively simple physics. Yeah, and Cameron might have opinions. So he's, he's like the real simulation guy. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, it's true. Like relativity is super important for describing a lot of the, the nature of our reality. But for all the simulations that I do, Einstein, or, I, I don't have to worry about relativistic effects. So when I'm trying to, to create a simulation to resolve the behavior of galaxies and individual stars and gas and dust that orbit within that galaxy, I... I basically can ignore all of relativity and just deal with gravitation as was defined by Newton 400 years ago and basically is encompassed in a very simple equation. Uh, and that's good enough. It's only when you get to the really extreme areas of when you're close to a black hole or when you're traveling at, when you have matter that's traveling near the speed of light that you need to take into account these relativistic effects. But for for most of the stuff in the universe, you can you can, you can get by with reasonably simple, simple stuff. That's not to say that like it can't get more complicated, but yeah, it's, it's kind of just saying like, you can get by with, with a, with a high school understanding of physics and be able to do, you know, reasonably high level stuff. Um, yeah, so I can add a little bit, um, maybe from a different perspective, because I'm actually not from America, I'm from Europe. And also, I guess I didn't really do any research until I was uh, an undergrad. But in that sense, I wouldn't under evaluate what you can actually do in high school. Like there's so many um, things you can do, such as, you know, this kind of thing where you seek out opportunities to uh, go to lectures by real, you know, astronomers and get a sense of what the field is like. Um, one thing I did in high school, of course, was, you know, joining a club so, such that you're you know, actually performing the the subject that you're interested in, in sort of a high school level with other people who are also interested in it. And through that, you can even do, you know, kind of like, like a training to do real research as well. 
And uh, of course, um, that can later lead to, uh, for example, like the Science Olympics. Um, that's, I think America does that. <laughs> you know, that's a, another great way to um, train to um, eventually become an astronomer. Yeah. Great, thank you, Eva. Uh, and related, uh, we have a, a, a good question for you on Mars stuff. So uh, let's see. If evidence of life were found, what would, what would that look like? And would scientists be able to speculate as to whether it was RNA or DNA, uh, like an RNA DNA based life, or would that be the next mission? I guess this is a specific to if life were detected using perseverance on the surface of Mars. Yeah, I like that question because we're going to go into like borderline philosophical territory here. Um, there are a few uh, parts to this question that I'll address each part. Um, so what do we expect life to be like on Mars? I guess the short answer is we don't really know, but we do know that it's not going to be microscopic life. We don't, we, we have already visited with rovers and satellites and we haven't found any evidence of macroscopic life yet. Uh, so we know that if there is going to be something, it's going to be microscopic. And so that's why our whole instrument suite basically is designed to detect microscopic signs of life. So those are, um, you know, imaging at a microscopic level, doing spectroscopy at a microscopic level. And so the spectroscopy instruments that we have can detect things such as, do we have an organic compound? So do we have our carbon hydrogen bondings, for example, but they're not detailed enough that they can actually do like a DNA sequencing and figure out, you know, which base pairs we have and whether it's RNA and whether it's DNA. But what will happen is that we will sample uh, different materials that we think are the most likely to contain any of these materials. And then in subsequent missions, um, these samples will be returned to Earth. Uh, we're still working on you know, the next mission that's actually going to return these to Earth. And once they're returned to Earth, you can actually take these samples and go into a biology laboratory and, and do that sequencing and try to get at that answer. So yeah, it's all very exciting. Any other, uh, any other, since it is a philosophical question at some level, any other opinions from the other panelists? I don't much think about life, to be honest. Um, it's kind of an unpopular thing to say as an exoplanet astronomer, where a lot of people say, the whole point of exoplanet astronomy is to find life outside of our solar system. Um, that's not the perspective I really take on that. I really wanna understand how planets form. And from that, we can understand how our solar system forms. So I'm definitely possibly in the minority of people um, with that where I, I don't actively think about life, but I definitely leave it to, to Eva to talk more about the, uh, the Mars side of that. I don't think we're just totally speculating when it comes to exoplanet atmospheres. We have no way of knowing really what's biosignatures, what these evidence of life would be. Um, so I think that's very, very far field, but if we're gonna- find... Related to that, what, what do you think the time scale for us having some sort of constraints on, on biosignatures from systems that, are, that we can't go to, like Perseverance, can go to the surface of Mars and, and really do an invasive, maybe invasive is not the right word, but, but a, a, a really like hands-on approach to being able to take samples and, and measure them when we're only just like getting light from these distant exoplanets. What, what do you think the future is on that? I think in terms of biosignatures that it's very, very hard to prove that something is absolutely formed by life. Uh, chemistry does wild things in wild circumstances. So if something is really high pressure or really high temperature, it can produce things that we don't necessarily expect to see on Earth, but we totally can see on exoplanets. I don't really know if we're, you know, definitely I don't think even within my lifetime we'll be able to, you know, say absolutely this is life. Uh, we can possibly say, you know, this might have been formed from life. It seems to have been more likely than being formed, you know, abiotically, but I don't think we're going to be absolutely able to determine for a very long time. I might be pessimistic, but. No, but that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, another question. How about, oh, I like this question. Uh, what role do supernovae play in regulating the flow of gas within a galaxy? I like this question because this is a hard question that we're still trying to address. I'm actually 
organizing an eight week long workshop that we're in the end of week seven, that's at some level trying to address this question. Um, we're doing it all virtually, so it's kind of a big mess, but it's a, a Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics program where you know something on the order of 250, 300 different scientists from around the world are meeting virtually over Zoom every day to discuss the, uh, the behavior of the atmospheres surrounding galaxies, which are harder, much like our atmosphere, is harder to observe because it's low density relative to the, the inner part of the galaxy. Um, and much of the behavior of that atmosphere is defined by supernovae that are going off in the center of the galaxy, in the, in the disk of the galaxy. What you normally think of when you think of the galaxy, you know, the bright part, this, the part that's illuminating, uh, that's pumping out photons and whatnot. And when those supernovae go off, they kick out an enormous amount of material, hot winds, gas that's, that's pushing bulk flows of material into this atmosphere, which can have a dramatic impact on the evolution of the galaxy thenceforth. And so yeah, supernovae drive winds, they drive flows of gas, and that will influence, I, I don't think this is a controversial statement, that will influence the behavior of the gas in the galaxy as well as around the galaxy. And it could cut off inflows of fresh material that would eventually form stars in the interior of the galaxy. Um, but the, the, the detailed behavior of how it all works is still up for grabs. We're still trying to understand it both through computer simulations as well as observations of this. But as I said, that, that kind of low density gas in the atmosphere surrounding the galaxy is so low density that it, it's very difficult to observe with our telescopes. Um, and you usually have to rely on uh, a, bright, a bright background source that, that comes in and then we, we look for the presence of that intervening gas in absorption through the, the absorption of certain wavelengths of light uh, what you'd get by looking at a spectrum and seeing a little dips at certain colors. But uh, yeah, it's a challenge, but I don't know that it seems in some ways related to what Kishiloi was discussing. So I don't know, do you guys want to add anything to, to that or no? It's okay if you don't, I'm just trying to, you know. No, I, I think you uh, summarized it really well. I think uh, you know, supernova, we, we, I think it's now well understood that um, Supernova explosions clearly play an uh, important role in in shaping the formation of galaxies. And I think, uh, in terms of maybe I can comment a bit on um, you know, what the next frontier is in in this research uh, from the point of view of finding supernovae as well. So uh, a lot of the uh, the current frontier in terms of um, understanding both supernovae and galaxy formation is to go very far in the past, like really close to the Big Bang, because we want to understand how the first galaxies were formed, how and what role did stars play in, in sort of either forming the new galaxies as well as destroying the new galaxies. And uh, one of the things that's becoming really interesting in terms of our picture for supernovae is that uh, the, the earlier we go into the universe, the more massive stars get. You know, you typically expect the most massive stars to have formed in the very early universe, which also means that if they ended up forming supernovae and we still do not have any concrete evidence that they actually form supernovae, they might just you know, directly collapse into black holes, you know, who knows? Uh, they, they think it's a very open field, but these extremely powerful supernovae probably had an important role in sort of almost breaking up these entire tiny galaxies that were forming at the time. And uh, one of the things that's the frontier in terms of supernova research is to actually take very deep space telescopes and try to look for these extremely far supernovae from the earliest epochs in the universe, the earliest times in the universe, and try to ask the question of, you know, did these extremely massive stars even explode? And if they did explode, then what kind of explosions did they produce? And was that, and how, what does that tell us about what happened to the galaxy itself? You know, is this energy enough to almost sort of blow up the entire galaxy and almost prevent galaxy formation in that, uh, in, in that sense? I'm trying to figure out how to unmute here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, addition. Um, okay, let's see. Mm, how about 
What observations can you make when viewing neutron star mergers through infrared telescopes? Because this was a big thing a couple of years ago when we discovered the first neutron stars that were merging and we saw them both in their gravitational waves that were output as well as from the, the electromagnetic waves, the, the photons, the light that we're used to seeing. Um, so what can we learn about that sort of thing from, from the infrared? Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, it, it sort of uh, lines up with sort of my interest in explosions in general. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, um, uh, you know, like you've um, already pointed out, infrared observations are extremely crucial when trying to understand these um, explosions. And I can talk a bit about that. So um, the really interesting part of neutron star mergers that makes them somewhat different from normal explosions like supernovae is the fact that we now understand that they produce a lot of heavy elements. And by heavy elements, I mean things like gold and platinum and silver and all of this stuff that we see around us. And they're heavy because if you look at the periodic table, they have these extremely large mass numbers and atomic numbers. So they are, um, uh, they are not easy to synthesize in the universe. And from what we know, uh, um, uh, a lot of you know, normal supernovae and normal stars don't tend to produce things that are uh, that go all the way up to extremely heavy elements in the periodic table. But as it turns out that these, these neutron star mergers were long hypothesized to be sites for how you could produce these extremely massive um, uh, elements. And as a result of having these extremely massive elements, the natural prediction was that because you have uh, these massive, these elements that have a lot of transition. So it's, you can think of it in the, in the same way as we saw that atmospheric transmission plot. So every element tends to absorb light at certain wavelengths, depending on what it's, uh, electro, what the structure of electrons is inside its individual, you know, shells and orbitals and so on. And uh, based on that, we, we, there was almost an expectation that uh, because these heavy elements have lots of electrons, they tend to completely absorb all of the optical light. So what we saw in the first gravitational wave event that was detected in electromagnetic waves as well was actual evidence of this where we saw that uh, relatively early on, we saw that the light turned extremely red. And you know, it's very similar to what extinction does in the sense, sorry, the, very similar to what dust does to light in the sense that when you have a lot of material that absorbs all of the optical light, it tends to turn very red. And when it turns very red, that's where all of the radiation then shifts to the infrared part of the spectrum. And in fact, this is one of the biggest drivers for infrared astronomy today, which is that uh, we expect that a very large fraction of neutron star mergers might not even have any detectable optical counterparts because the heavy elements produced in these explosions, they nearly absorb all of the optical light because of their electronic structure, making them a, almost a pure infrared type of explosion. And this is you know, one of the frontiers in infrared astronomy, which is to try to detect these explosions in the infrared. And the other thing that's really sort of uh, related to this uh, question is that it turns out that because there's almost no light in the optical from these explosions, because it all gets absorbed, the infrared light actually tells us a lot about which elements were produced and in what amount. So, you know, with future observations, infrared observations of the neutron star mergers, what we might be able to say is to say that this explosion over there produced, you know, whatever, hundreds, hundred earth masses of gold and 50 earth masses of silver. And, you know, uh, mapping out this diversity, trying to map out how much of uh, heavy elements are produced in different types of neutron star mergers is really sort of the, 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 uh, the frontier in terms of uh, gravitational wave astronomy today. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, do we have any instances of a second binary neutron star merger that have been detected optically or, or, or in infrared or in gravitational waves? I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, so uh, there is, uh, so in the last um, observing run for LIGO Virgo, which is the gravitational wave observatories, they did detect um, a, a, a neutron star merger where two neutron star mergers merged into you know, whatever uh, was left behind. And, but it turns out that in this particular case, um, uh, the detection was not um, very strong in the sense that the signal was very weak, which means that they could not uh, sort of point, point out which part of the sky it could be in. So uh, when these gravitational observatories detect things, they tend to sort of roughly point, say that, hey, it might be in that part of the sky. But this time when they came out with that detection, they said that, okay, it's in the sky. 
and you know that that's pretty much it so so that really sort of was a problem for us astronomers trying to point it out because you know it's a you know the sky is really big you know it's big and, it's hard to know yeah yeah, yeah yeah they just said that okay something happened in the sky pretty much that was the information that we got <laughs> okay. Um, okay. but it, i think it is a it, it was a genuine detection, you know, the, 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 it has been published as a genuine detection. It's just that it was too hard for us to localize it and find the counterpart. But, you know, hopefully uh, things will get better uh, in the next runs. Um, uh, and another thing that uh, is, uh, that's probably related to this, since you mentioned um, other neutron star mergers, is that for a long time, um, there are these things called short gamma ray bursts. Uh, which are essentially bursts of gamma rays that are detected by space satellites. And we believe that uh, some population of those gamma ray bursts come from neutron star mergers. So there are some instances of infrared sources that have been detected coincident with these gamma ray bursts. And that's what we think that it's, it's consistent with, uh, with uh, you know, a, 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 a neutron star merger like explosion that was first detected in the gamma rays and then sort of we saw evidence of it in, in the infrared. Cool. I didn't know that about um, just all the optical light getting absorbed and only the infrared is, is able to escape. That's pretty exciting. Um, okay, so uh, there's been a, a whole bunch of discussion uh, surrounding the perchlorate content of, of Mars. Uh, so I figured this is a good time to ask that for Eva. Is the perchlorate in Mars soil thought to have been present early in the planet's history, or is it a more recent development? And if it's the latter, are there any ideas for the source? Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, just so that everyone is on the same page, um, perchlorate is basically chlorine and oxygen in a, um, you know, a molecular bonding, and it's a, it's a salt, basically. So your, your favorite salt is probably perchlorate that is connected to some kind of metal, typically sodium or something like that. Um, and so the answer to the question is there's actually been both uh, perchlorate detected that is far to have an ancient origin and some that maybe have a um, more modern origin. So the ancient perchlorate um, was detected with the Curiosity rover actually. And uh, one of the people who was uh, part of detecting it was uh, actually a grad student here at Caltech, Peter Martin, who uh, graduated last year, I think, or two years ago. Um, so so the, those Curiosity rover measurements are of about 3 billion, 3 to 5, uh, sorry, 3 to 3.5 billion year old rocks. So those are ancient record detections. And the idea there is that, you know, you, when you form a salt, maybe you've done like a high school or middle school experiment where you super saturate some kind of solution and you precipitate a salt. So that's typically how a salt forms. So the idea is that, yeah, you did have water that precipitated a salt at some point. There are other speculations such as, could you maybe oxygenate your chlorine just with the atmosphere? That, you know, it's possible, but it's not something we see very often. For the more recent uh, perchlorate detections, um, these were actually associated with what's called the um, uh, reoccurring slope lineae, which are these dark streaks that we see on Mars's surface that um, has been detected before to correlate with perchlorates. And the he idea here is that fact actually that um, maybe there is liquid water that is uh, precipitating these perchlorates uh, seasonally. What then happened and this was another grad student at Caltech, whose name was Ellen Leesk, is that she actually uses this uh, spectroscopy instrument that was used to detect these modern perchlorates and found that there is a, um, there's a sort of a um, correction anomaly that incidentally causes a absorption right there where that perchlorate absorption is. So the community is actually going back and sort of reassessing whether those modern perchlorates are there or not. Uh, but the, the idea is that, yeah, maybe they're forming from liquid water that's there present on Mars that happens seasonally. That's super exciting. So do, do you think that Perseverance, more so than the previous rovers and, uh, and missions to Mars, may be able to resolve, like, is there, is there seasonal water on the surface or, or is it sub, subsurface or... Yeah, so Perseverance um, targets are more, more geared towards ancient environments. It's actually such that um, <clears throat> where these reoccurring slopes are, are actually a part of the planetary protection 
uh, because if there's liquid water, there could be a modern biosphere there. So they're actually part of the place that we um, are necessarily some exceptional reason to cannot actually go and visit with the rover. So um, Perseverance could address ancient diploids, but not these modern diploids that are under plans of Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Got about 10 minutes left. We'll try and try and cover as many questions as we can. Um, here, here's a good question for Nicole. Why have so few exoplanets been discovered via astrometry? Yeah, it's mostly because the easiest way of doing it is like Cameron had alluded to before, just looking at the sky and looking for periodic dimming and light. It's just the easiest way of doing it. So that's the transit method. It's been the most fruitful in terms of the number of planets that it's found. And that's basically because of, of two major missions, but you have Kepler, which stared at the same portion of the sky. Um, and then eventually in its extended mission looked at other portions. But when you look at the same portion of the sky long enough, you're going to be able to see very long period planets. So you need to be able to basically have, like Cameron showed with his hands before, you need to have the planet pass in front of the star with respect to your line of sight. But if the planet's super far out, it's gonna take a long time to go around. I mean, you could think about, you know, our own solar system. You know, we go around much quicker than the planets that are further out do. And, you know, a year here is different than what you'd consider a year on Jupiter, for example. So it's just simpler to do it through the transit method. You can, you know, use a fairly small telescope like Kepler and just stare at the same portion of the sky and get thousands of planets. Uh, that's being followed up by TESS, uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is looking at the whole sky to map out where sort of all the planets are in that are around close and bright stars. Um, but it's basically just because of how easy it is to detect the transit method. That's why it's been the most fruitful. Ah, trying to get my mute button off. Um, okay, so there's another question. I was looking up something on the web to show a nice little visual associated with it. Uh, there was a recent question that someone asked about is the cosmic web accepted theory? Um, so for reference, just so people know what this is talking about, let me show a picture of the cosmic web. Um, the cosmic web is this sort of thing. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah, so uh, this is kind of a, this is the output from a simulation showing roughly the distribution of matter on very large scales that we get out of our computer simulations. And so the, the yellow kind of amber colored structures are galaxies or clusters of galaxies. That's where, where matter tends to fall and it tends to distribute itself in this kind of web-like structure, kind of like a spider web with defined by filaments and then where filaments might intersect, you get kind of these, these uh, clusters of galaxies or, or, or nodes. And in between the filaments and sheets of material are big voids where there isn't as much stuff. We don't see as many galaxies. And so to answer the question, it's not just that our computer simulations show this, it's that when we look at the distribution I'll use my background. When we look at the distribution of, oh, my hand's disappearing. When we look at the distribution of like galaxies as we look up in the sky, they aren't just uniformly distributed in a grid and they're not just randomly distributed either. They have the same kind of structure. They have these filaments where you'll see a bunch of galaxies all kind of in a line along this filament and then over with this filament as well. And then where those filaments kind of intersect and there's a bunch of structures there. And that's what we for, refer to as the cosmic web. So we see that in simulations and we see it in observations. And so, yeah, I would say that that it's, it's an outcome of our current model for the universe, which is which we describe as Lambda CDM, which is a big fancy word for our words for uh, the universe as defined by having dark matter and having dark energy that cause the distribution of matter to occur along this kind of cosmic web structure. But yeah, we see it happening. So we're reasonably sure that it's happening. Yeah, I think everyone's in agreement. I think this is settled. We don't necessarily understand everything about dark matter and about dark energy, but we understand many of their effects on large scales, which define this sort of structure. So 
Uh, okay. Can I, can I add something to that? I, I thought oh, yeah, absolutely. Really, Please. Uh, really cool from, from in terms of the science that I do. Um, so it turns out that because we are um, uh, capable of finding many thousands of supernovae uh, per year nowadays, what we actually see is that when we try to you know, project these supernovae in terms of where they are on the sky and how far they are, we see the same structures appearing in terms of the, you know, where the galaxy, so in, we see the galaxies like Cameron was mentioning, we see them line up in these strings and uh, these clumps in the universe. And because the supernovae are happening from stars inside those galaxies, you can almost always nearly see that the same structure in the supernovae as well. Because you'll see, if you plot out the three-dimensional distribution of supernovae, you will start seeing these structures of, uh, you know, individual explosions happening along those individual filaments. So I thought, I, 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 when, I, when I first sort of realized this, I thought it was really cool that we could actually see this in exploding stars as well. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Seeing it in the distribution of galaxies, seeing it in the distribution of uh, supernovae. And there's, there's new work that's going into trying to be able to ind like identify the filaments themselves from low density gas, but it's very, very low density. So it takes uh, very high precision instruments that were only just uh, building right now to have this capability. But this is, um, in fact, there's an instrument that was designed by a professor in Caltech, Chris Martin, called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager, KCWI, that was put on the Keck telescopes in Hawaii um, in the last three years or so, and um, is just at the ability to maybe be able to observe this. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a frontline level of research that that is going into this. Okay, uh, we've got like three minutes. I like this question. It's a little off the wall and I think it kind of applies to all of us. And that is, do you think we have discovered the entire electromagnetic spectrum or might there be areas in space that emit types of waves that we don't have locally? And kind of related to that is, is there any method to see not just feel gravitational waves? Because I feel like these are both like kind of mind bendy questions about what are other ways in which we can perceive the universe that perhaps we haven't discovered or taken advantage of thus far. What do you guys think? I know they're challenging questions, I, but yeah, I, I guess. A little bit here, so. um, yeah, I've been a bit in touch with this, which I, which is where I can, I guess I can start. So uh, right now, one of the biggest sort of hot and happening things in astronomy is this thing called multi-messenger astronomy. And where the idea is that, you know, we don't really depend, we don't have to depend on light to study the universe. There are other forms of particles or waves that also allow us to study the universe. And one of them being gravitational waves, as in many of you would know. So gravitational waves are ripples in space time that can now be detected thanks to these amazing instruments called LIGO and Virgo and in the future other instruments as well, that which are almost an independent way of studying the universe because it's not electromagnetic radiation, you know, the light that we see. Uh, in terms of other messengers, the other really interesting um, you know, emerging fields is one, neutrinos. So neutrinos are uh, extremely light particles that almost do not interact with any form of normal matter, like the stuff that we see around us. But uh, thanks to some amazing experiments that are now being built on Earth, we have some capabilities to detect neutrinos. Um, and uh, the, these are interesting because there are a lot of extreme astrophysical environments where we expect neutrinos to be formed. And because we can you know, now sort of moving into an era where we can detect them, this is another sort of frontier in terms of looking at the universe with different types of waves. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention are cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are extremely energetic particles that we that are, um, I think they are mostly just protons. So essentially these are hydrogen atoms that do not have their corresponding electron. And these are produced from extremely powerful shocks that are produced by things like supernovae uh, when they crash into the nearby gas. And these cosmic rays are something that we can also detect now in a variety of methods. I think, you know, to name a few that we can even detect them now thanks to uh, radio instruments. We can detect the effects that cosmic rays have on the atmosphere and detect them in radio waves. So I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a great question. I think in terms of what we have not seen so far is really going um, you know, towards alternative messengers for astronomy, you know, not just light. I agree. Um, I, I would say like, as a direct response to the question, like, are there other forms of electromagnetic waves that we can't see? 
we haven't necessarily probed. So we've probed, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, you probably remember from elementary school or high school, you know, shows different waves and it gets increasingly high frequency at one end and low frequency at the other. So you have like, sorry, I'm doing this horribly with a, with a hand drawn, not even drawn, but like the radio waves in the low energy part of the spectrum and then microwaves and then infrared and then a visible wavelengths, optical light and then UV and then X-ray and then gamma rays. And we've, we have instruments that can operate in all of that range of energies and wavelengths. Um, we do have a hard cutoff in the radio side, the low energy, because our atmosphere is really effective at blocking uh, light from, that's below a certain wavelength. So there are things that we can't see in the universe that are farther in the direction of radio waves. But maybe if we build a, a, a telescope that's a space telescope above our atmosphere, we would be able to perceive those. So we don't really have a window like that on the universe although we think we understand what might be going on there. Um, and then in the high energy uh, short wavelength regime, the super ultra high energy gamma rays, we, we don't have things operating that far over there, but I think, I think we have some constraints just because those photons would be so energetic, they would have implications for, like if they were slamming into the atmosphere, we'd see their effects on the atoms in the atmosphere and the molecules in the atmosphere. So, but Kishaloi makes a great point about um, other methods due to this multi-messenger astronomy of neutrinos or cosmic rays or gravitational waves like we've discussed. And um, there are probably other things that we will likely discover, different windows on the universe that we'll discover in, in coming years as technology continues to improve. But I don't know. Um, do either Eva or Nicole have any thoughts on this kind of crazy question? No. I think very specifically about the infrared normally, so not really. Okay. Same actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we've we've reached nine o'clock. I, I realize Omar Sadek, I'm sorry we haven't been able to address your question about cosmological natural selection. I'm not as familiar with it, and I'm not sure that the other panelists are, but but um, we can, I, I don't know, do you guys want to address this question in the last like couple minutes? Uh, well, I'll read up and I will be able to address it next month. Um, so so I'm sorry, that'll be that'll be my homework. I have I have too much homework, but but i'll I'll, I'll work on that one and try and give you an educated response to that whole that whole thing. So we aren't trying to ignore you. Some of the questions we don't address, it's just because we don't know the answers. So, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. It's a learning opportunity for all of us. So anyway, um, thanks everybody for coming. Our next event will be roughly a month from now. Uh, I don't remember who's speaking or what it will be on. Uh, we will have an astronomy on tap in the coming couple of weeks uh, addressing, I think the talks are entitled 2021, a climate change odyssey, which will be interesting about uh, what we know about climate change and what we know about climate change related to perhaps um, if there are astronomical sources that are contributing to this or if there aren't, but we'll get the, we'll get the lowdown on that. And then another talk called Fire and Ice that's all about uh, different forms of cold and hot plasma in the outer parts of the galaxy and how they form and how those, those different uh, phases of gas form and what they can tell us about galaxy evolution and star formation and so on and so forth. So should be cool. Stay tuned to our YouTube or our social media or our Caltech astronomy website and I'll have information up about those in the next, next few days. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Keisha Loy, thank you, excellent. Excellent presentation. Congratulations on your Hubble, Hubble Fellowship. Uh, Nicole and Eva, keep up the good work on exoplanets and on Mars Perseverance. Congratulations on the landing. Super excited to see what comes of that in the coming months and years. So uh, thanks everybody. We will see you. We will see everyone next time. Bye. Okay, I ended the stream.